For most boats, the important thing technically that you have to do if you're going to leave her for a long time in the winter is to settle the engine down so that it will be happy and ready for you when you come back. I'm going to lift up the steps here, which this excellent boat gives me good engine access. I've got more access around the side. First thing you do when you're going to leave the engine is fill the fuel tanks up. If you don't fill the fuel tanks up, air will come in through the breathers during the winter. It'll be moist air, very likely. It'll come in on a warmish day and it'll be slopping around in there on top of the, on top of the fuel, touching all those lovely cool surfaces of the tank. And then you get a freezing night, the tank cools right down, the water condenses and it dribbles down and it ends up at the bottom of the tank and you've got water in your diesel, which you do not want. And all you have to do to stop this happening is fill the tanks right up when you leave the boat. You've got to fill them next year anyway, so look on it as an investment. And while you're at it, put some bug inhibitor in there. One of the worst things with diesel these days, with biodiesel, this is making it happen, you get bugs in your diesel. You can't believe that. Nothing you'd think could live in that awful stuff, but it does. And it makes a horrible black sludge that gets into your pipes and fouls your injection. It's just gruesome stuff and, and you don't want it. So the bug inhibitor will help to stop that happening. So after you've filled the tanks, you're going to motor back to your berth. Well, that's great because you need to run the engine for at least a quarter of an hour, a uh, bit longer really, I would say, and that will pull the fuel right through from the tank. The new inhibited fuel will come through the pipes and go through the injectors. Everything will be clear. So that's the first thing. When you arrive at the berth, because you've done all this motoring, the oil in the engine is lovely and hot. And when oil gets hot, it thins out. So it's a good time to change the oil. So that's the next job. Changing the engine oil uh, in a boat is not the easiest of jobs. With a car, you just open the plug at the bottom of the sump and it all drops out. That's it. And then you fill it up from the top when you put the plug back in and the job's done. It's a bit more difficult on a boat because you can't just take a plug out of the bottom and drop the oil out because it'll all drop into the bilge. So what you do, there's a tube coming up the side of the engine, usually, somewhere, and you poke a little pipe down that and you have a pump. And when the oil is nice and hot, it's fluid and very, it, it just flows beautifully. So you pump it out with a little stirrup pump that you get, or you might have a bigger pump that you can stand on and pump like that, and it will fill the reservoir of the pump, <coughs> or at worst, if you've got a real cheap little stirrup pump, you poke the end of the pipe into a gallon container and shove it into there. And most boats, a big five litre container will do it. It'll be enough. If you've got a really big engine, you'll need more, but otherwise that generally is enough. So you pump all the oil out, it'll be nice and hot, when it's all gone, you'll feel the pump gurgling when it gets to the bottom of the sump. Take the pump away, very careful so you don't drop any of the nasty black oil into the bilge, and uh, take the oil away. And while you're about it, change the oil filter. On a modern engine, that's very easy. You just spin the old oil filter off. You might need a strap spanner for that. That's a, a, um, a spanner. You buy it real cheap from somebody like Screwfix. Just put it on the, put it on the filter, give it a heave. That starts it spinning and the filter literally spins off on a thread. Make sure when you take it off that you put it right way up, otherwise it'll spill. I usually get some old nappies. I buy some nappies and uh, I put them under all these things so that if anything drips out, it drips into the nappy and the nappy will catch anything, <laughs> as any parent will tell you. So there you go. You've got your oil filter. Pour that into the uh, oil container and then put it away with a plastic bag around it and take it away to the special dump for oil filters, which most marinas have now. Same with the oil. There'll be somewhere to dump the oil and uh, dispose of that responsibly. Then all you've got to do is spin on your new filter, which you get from the engine manufacturer. You might even get it from the chandlery and put in some new oil. And that's the engine oil and filter done. That's your first big job. And it's not hard, really. Anybody can do that. The next job, I would suggest is to change the fuel filters. There's probably a big filter, very likely a thing called a Raycor, a pre-filter which is between the tank and the engine. I don't know where that is on your boat but it'll be easy enough to find and that will have a filter unit in it which you take out and replace. Now before you do this it's a good idea to turn off the fuel because otherwise it's going to keep pouring out everywhere. There's another filter on the engine itself which also needs to be changed 
But if your main filter is doing its job and you're not doing very many engine hours, you can probably get away with doing the other one every, every other year because the fuel that's getting to that should be pretty clean anyway. The engine manufacturers will tell you otherwise, of course, because they have to cover themselves. And I understand that. It's best if you do do them both. But if you're running out of steam by this time and are losing the will to live, don't worry about that one. If it was done last year, just leave it this year if you haven't done many hours and, and rely on the other one. So change your pre-filter. You've then got to bleed the fuel through. You'll find out how to do that in any number of articles I've written or any textbook, merely to say that it's a good time to change the fuel filters. And when you've done that, you're going to sort out the heat exchanger so it doesn't deteriorate over the winter. Heat exchangers have salt water going through them all the time. And they don't like that. They deteriorate. The salt water causes electrolysis and all sorts of nasty things can happen. There may be an anode in the, in the heat exchanger. And if there is, change it now. Don't leave it till the spring. Do it now. And then you've got to do this wonderful thing that you do with your heat exchanger. And this is the best trick I've ever learned. Uh, I only started doing this fairly recently and you only do it if you're going to lay the boat up and not use the engine. If you're going to use the engine uh, every couple of weeks or something just to keep it running, then that's a different thing. But if you're going to lay the boat up properly, this is what you do. You shut the engine seacock and then you go to the water filter, the strainer, and you take the lid off that and you have a pier in and you can see that there's water in there. There might well be some crud in there which is worth cleaning out at this stage. Take out the basket, get it nice and clean, put it back in again. And now you get a watering can and you get a gallon or four litres if you like of antifreeze. Four litres will probably do it for most boats um, that are less than 50 feet long. Five litres maybe. Split it 50-50 with water and fill your watering can. Fresh water and fill your watering can. Then with the lid off the strainer, you start the engine. And after a while, as the engine starts demanding cooling water, you'll see the level go down in the strainer. And you top it up with this antifreeze mix from your watering can. And you pour it in, and you keep pouring it in until your antifreeze is all gone, and then you stop the engine. And you put the lid back on, you leave the seacock shut, and that's you. Antifreeze has got lubricating qualities and it's also got anti-corrosive properties. If you use the right stuff, uh, I've recently learned that there are two sorts of antifreeze. There's ethylene glycol that you put in your car, which is not terribly good for anti-corrosion apparently, and it's also bad for the environment. But propylene glycol, which you should be able to buy from the chandlery, is much, much kinder to everything in the sea. So you're going to be pumping this through into the river or into the sea, wherever you are. Use propylene glycol if you can get it. Proper marine antifreeze. And you're doing your engine some good as well. And it's easy to do and very satisfying. Laying up the loos is a thing that's well worth doing. If you just leave them as they are, especially if they're salt water flushed, which nearly everybody's is, um, it'll end up smelly for sure. If you're Laying up in the water in the southern part of England, I've never known a loo freeze solid and, 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 and cause major damage. It could happen, I suppose, and if you're in any doubts about that, then put some antifreeze in there. But uh, essentially, what you do is flush it with fresh water. Give it a good old flush round with fresh water. Give the bowl a good old clean. Get loads of it in there. And then pump it out. Now this loo is electric, so we're going to get a big noise effect and it's going to pump it out electrically. There it goes. And now I'm going to do it again. Really good flush so that it's as clean as it can be. This is after I've cleaned the loo in the normal way. If I've got any doubts at all about freezing, I'm going to put a little bit of antifreeze down there and just help it down and get it through into the pumps. So uh, that's it. If you're putting the boat on the hard, and you're really worried about freezing, the only thing to do is to take the inlet pipe off its seacock, put it in a bucket of antifreeze and water, and pump the whole loo right through from there. That's pretty extreme, but if you're worried about freezing, that's the safest thing to do. Well, we've done the engine and we've done the loos, so we can now turn off all the seacocks in the boat. That just makes sense, doesn't it? Nothing more need be said about that. Make sure they're all working and that they're all off. And then write yourself notes to tell you 
that you've turned them off and stick them up all over the place, especially that one about the engine. Gear me, starting the engine with a seacock off is a really bad idea. So make sure it's physically impossible to do that. Right, what's next? Batteries. I don't know about you, but I've got a load of batteries on my boat and I really look after them. I'm really careful with them and they've lasted for ages. People say their batteries only last two or three years. I don't know what they're doing, but this is what I do with mine in the winter. And I don't think you can do better, really. I get myself down with them and I get a good spanner and I undo all the terminals, both sides. I take them all off. Now, you may say you don't have to do that. All you have to do is take off the earth terminals and everything's isolated. That's probably true. But just to be sure and to make sure all the nuts are working and nothing's seized up, I take them all off. I'm careful about noting where they've come off. Sometimes I take photographs of them with my phone so I know where to put them back when the spring comes because otherwise you can make some bad mistakes. But you take all of the terminals off having first charged the batteries right up so that they're absolutely singing. I don't mind how you charge your batteries whether you do it by being plugged in or by running the engine for 12 hours or whatever it is you do. But do it, get them charged up, all of them, Mine, I've got four house batteries, I've got an engine start battery, I've got a generator start battery and I've got a socking great big one that lurks up forehead that drives my windlass and my bow thruster. Every single one of them gets charged right up and then disconnected. And if you do that, they'll see you through the winter. They're just sitting there dormant. And if they're in halfway decent shape, they should be all right. My domestic batteries are eight years old and they are still delivering the goods. There's no problem with them and this is what I do with them every winter. When I'm cruising the boat, of course, they get charged up well and if I'm in a marina when I'm cruising, I plug into the side and uh, they're all charging up all night long, 14 volts and all the rest of it and it's great. And if you do that, you should be fine. If you're sailing around the world, of course, and you uh, uh, let your batteries go flat time after time because you're doing the best you can and sometimes it just has to happen. They won't last so long, but if you're doing coastal cruising they should last for ages if they're good ones in the first place. The alternative, of course, is to leave the boat in semi-commission and have her plugged in all the time uh, with your magical battery chargers sniffing the batteries, sensing them, conditioning them and doing everything that you want to do with them. Um, you can do that, that's an alternative, that's the lazy man's way out. But for me, disconnect them and be done with it. Unless, of course, you're going to come down to the boat every other weekend, in which case you better leave them plugged in. But do think about the batteries. Don't just assume they're going to perform for you, because in the end, if you do, they won't. However much we love our country, we've got to admit that Britain's a damp, miserable place, and boats feel very lonely and unloved hanging around on marinas in the winter. So we can cheer them up a bit with a few simple things and we can do it without interfering with the batteries if we've got shore power that runs straight through. Get your shore power organised and if you get yourself a dehumidifier that will keep the air reasonably dry inside the boat and stop a lot of condensation and mildew happening. You can keep the temperature up above freezing at least with simple greenhouse heaters. They cost a few pennies they burn almost no electricity and you plug them in. This is about the same as an old 40 watt light bulb, I should think. And yet they do a wonderful job keeping the boat warm. This one's slightly more powerful and I've had one of those for years on my boat. And actually on this boat, we think it'd be a very good thing just to pop it in the engine room. And just keep the engine nice and warm so it doesn't feel cold and damp and unloved. This is the main thing. What you mustn't do is put a fan heater on the boat. It's very tempting to do that because they're wonderful things, aren't they? But, you know, they, are, they draw a lot of power. And it's not that we're being mean and don't want to stump up for the electricity. It is that on a boat in winter, a fan heater can be downright dangerous. If things don't work out the way it wants them to work out, the wiring gets hot and before you know, you've got a crackling boat fire going and you're in a marina. If you're lucky, yours is the only boat that burns down. The dehumidifier. Here's the little pipe that takes the water out. It just dribbles out of there. You don't see much coming out and you think there's not much of it. But over the weeks, it doesn't half make a lot of water. And it's going to go somewhere. Well, we're putting ours down the sink and that makes a lot of sense. And guess where it's going after that? It's lovely clean water. It's going out into the river. So long as I leave the seacock on. So we make an exception for that seacock and we leave it on. Because if we don't, we get a boat full of water. One thing you must do is get everything off the boat that you can. 
cushions and things, they just sit there festering all winter, even with your dehumidifier and your tube heater running, they don't like it. Things go on under the cushions, particularly where you've been sleeping. If you've been sleeping on a bunk night after night in hot weather, I don't like to mention it, but we all sweat at night and, and the cushion gets a bit damp. You may not be able to feel it, but it gets a bit damp and then you pull it up in the spring and you find it's all black mildew underneath. It didn't have to happen. Ideally, take the cushions off, take them home, put them in a nice dry loft. If you haven't got a nice dry loft, then at least lift them up so that the air can circulate underneath them. Take all the food off the boat. It's easy to leave things around. Make sure the fridge door's left open because that doesn't half pong if you shut it. You can be as clean as you like and there'll be something going on in there every time. Always leave the doors slightly cracked. Same with the lockers. If you can leave them open, good. But get all the food and the drink off. But my advice is always leave a bottle of whiskey on board because if you come down in the winter to see what's going on, you'll be needing that, won't you? Clean the boat thoroughly, right through. When you get the cushions up, have a real good go all the way through. And then when you've done that, you're ready to start thinking about getting your safety equipment ashore. Um, I've got a couple of life jackets here. These are from Ocean Safety, who actually look after all my safety gear, and I'm very, very satisfied with them. Um, they'll advise you on what you need to do. They'll advise you about everything, really, about flares, life rafts, all that stuff. Uh, my boat, I have a, a John Boy, I have a life raft, and I have a set of life jackets and of course flares. I, like most of us, I hate replacing the flares because you never use them and it costs you all that money and it just makes you bleed, doesn't it? But you've got to do it and Ocean Safety will help you and explain to you what you really have to have for what you're doing and what perhaps you might manage without. So they're great for that. Um, they'll tell you how often you have to do your life jackets and they'll do them for you. And it's not tremendously expensive. It's really worth getting it done. I used to do my own uh, weigh the bottles, do all that stuff but, and repack them, but really for the time it takes me and for the security I'd rather let uh, professionals do it. The life raft you can't mess about with. I tried servicing one of them up myself once and that, that was a disaster. You get a new one and it's guaranteed for, I don't know, two, three years, whatever, and you don't have to have anything done. But after that, every two years, mate, you've got to have it done. If you're taking people's money and using your boat commercially, you've got to have it done every year. It's not cheap and none of us like it, but it's a case of groan you may and go you must. Everything that's electronic on the boat that you can lift, take it off and take it home. It just makes a lot of sense to do that in all sorts of ways. First of all, if anybody comes pilfering, they can't nick it. Secondly, and here's a point, look at that little plug there. If you just leave something plugged in for years, in the end it degrades and it doesn't work so well. And all you have to do to keep it working is plug it and unplug it a few times. It's worth doing that with everything really in the springtime when you come back on board. Things that have been plugged in all winter, just unplug them, have a look at them, cheer them up a bit if necessary and plug them back in again. It makes a lot of difference. If you've got a paddle wheel log on your boat with a, with a transducer that goes through the hull, you probably already know how to bring it in to clear it and push the plug down, what I call the dead man, the thing that goes down in the hole and secures and keeps the water out. In the winter, I reckon it's worth pulling the actual transducer in and keeping it inside the boat, putting the plug in. Um, two reasons for that. First of all, it's just going to be sitting there for months with all the crud of the world landing on it and it's not going to like that. It's much better to get it out, get it nice and clean and stow it. And the other reason is that with the best will in the world, there's always the chance that the crane man will get it wrong and put his sling right on the top of your expensive impeller. Won't matter if you got your plug in, will it? Walking around the marina, you look at the way the boats are secured alongside and really it's like a monument to the creative capacity of man because it's a shambles really, but you can get away with it because it's the summertime, it's not too bad and, and there's not going to be anything really violent happens and uh, marinas are so kind and gentle to boats that you can get away with murder. But winter is a different matter altogether. You're sitting there, the wind's blowing 40 knots, hammering you off the dock and the ropes are taking a beating. And it's really important that the ropes don't chafe against the side of the boat or against anything else. And walking around the marina, I've been looking for some examples and I've found a cracker here. This is not really too bad at the moment. In this weather, it's managing fine on this yacht here. He's put the end of the rope on the cleat, as you can see. Not a great practice, but he's what he's decided to do. And then it comes over this chafing piece 
and the chafing piece is working after a fashion for a short time but if it sits there for three months that's going to saw away at that rope with a lot of wind blowing the boat off maybe a little bit of movement on the water graunch 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 it'll get there and that rope will be seriously weakened it might even part two good things you can do about this the first is rig some chafing gear if we have a look at the naiad we've been on actually it's a new boat and um, Mr Nyad has actually put chafing gear on the loop so that that won't happen on his boat. Sadly, he hasn't got it quite long enough. It's a good effort, but really it's better if you rig your own chafing gear, nice meaty bits of hose, get them in there and make them do the job. And the other thing you can do is come and have a look at your boat every month or so. Make sure that she's all right. Look at her lines, go down below, make sure everything's all right. And uh, if you can't do that, make a formal arrangement with the marina to do it for you. Don't just leave it to chance. Get it all set up, send them an email so that everybody knows what's what. And if they charge you a few quid, don't worry about it because it's an awful lot cheaper than getting in your car and driving down here from London and losing the day's work. So there you go, two ways to avoid chafe. At some stage during this procedure, you've got to think about your sails. If you're short-handed, as I am, just me and my wife, in a 45 foot boat. I look at those sails and I think, oh no, not again. It is a big job. Uh, you've got to fold them up and get them down and by the time you finish they're quite heavy. Taking your sails off in the winter is pretty critical I think. You don't want to leave them up there for the storms of winter to mash them up and uh, maybe it'll come unrolled. If you must leave the head sail up you've got to tie it up properly. Don't just rely on the sheets. Get a proper lashing around it so it cannot be pulled out by a gale of wind because the destruction is horrible if it happens and it doesn't end there if there's thrashing on the end of the forestay it'll damage the rig as well it's just nasty so the best thing you can do is take it off have a good look at it uh, store it somewhere dry and really the best time to take it off is after you've been sailing in torrential rain when, when there's not much wind and it hasn't got salt on it so it's absolutely clean and put it away dry Make sure it is dry because otherwise you might get those little spots of mildew and, and then it's ready for the new season. If it needs any work, get it into the sailmaker straight away because he's probably fairly quiet in October, November time, but come February, March, he'll be flat out and he won't be pleased to see you. So do it now. Your mainsail, if you've got an in-mass main, you're really not going to want to take that down, but you really should because if you don't, your little bit that comes out on the heavily reinforced clue, it's all going to go green and nasty. And as it gets rolled up inside the groove, the very likely there'll be some green developing there and you'll pull it out and it'll look like a patchwork quilt. Just horrible. Much nicer to take it off. I know it's not easy, but you can do it. And when you've done it, you'll be happy. Right, we're done. I've locked up and I've got two sets of keys, one safe in my pocket, and the other one is going straight up to the harbour master so that he can get on board if he really needs to. When I get home, I've got one final job, and that is to just give my insurance agent a call. Tell him I've laid the boat up, where she is, what's happening, and when I expect to come back. You probably don't have to do that, and he might just say, well, that's very kind of you to give me a call. We always like to know what's going on, and they do. Yacht insurance is a personal business. He'll be pleased to hear from you, and it will reassure you that all is well. So that's it. I'm away now. All I can say is, happy Christmas. <laughs>